Um, let's start as people continue to join us. Good morning, um, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome. My name is Isabella Cordua, and I'm research coordinator with NIR, the Network for Empowered Aid Response. I'll be your moderator for today. Uh, we have more than 200 people registered to join us, so we are very thrilled to see um, such interest. NIR and the Feinstein International Center at Tufts University have been working together on a BHA-funded study exploring the localization of humanitarian research. Today, we will present uh, to you some of the report's key findings and reflect on the experiences of uh, national and local humanitarian research institutions and individual researchers in the Global South, um, their unique contributions to humanitarian research and the barriers they face in getting investment, uh, visibility and uptake for their research. Our program begins with a panel of experts we have three speakers lined up to speak, uh, who I will introduce just in a minute. After we hear from the experts, we will have an open Q&A. As your questions arise, please drop them into the Q&A, but uh, do not use the chat as we will only monitor the Q&A. We have reserved about 30 minutes to discuss your questions at the end of this uh, discussion. We will get to as many as possible, as many questions as we have time. Um, if we don't get to your question during this session, please email me and I will either reply to you directly uh, in writing or pass the question on to the most relevant panelists. We'll put the email address in the chat and you'll see it on a slide in the end. Uh, now, I am delighted to introduce you to our speakers. We have uh, Teddy Atim, visiting fellow at the Feinstein International Center, which is based at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University. She was one of the authors of the report, and she will present the, some of the key findings. Uh, Gan Karume, technical advisor with Rebuild Hope for Africa. He will discuss the importance of localizing humanitarian research and bringing about uh, structural change, tackling funding, partnerships, coordination, capacity, and leadership to address power imbalances and ensure equitable research practices. Jennifer Lee, uh, humanitarian advisor with USAID's Bureau for um, uh, humanitarian assistance. Uh, Jen will tell us about USAID's efforts towards localization in human humanitarian action, as well as the considerations that still need to be addressed. Um, so let's get started from Teddy, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Isabella, for that wonderful introduction. Um, like they've already introduced me, my name is Teddy Atima. I'm speaking from Kampala in Uganda. Uh, of course, the result of the study I'm going to present is based on interviews conducted with Global South humanitarian researchers and uh, research institutions, but also with a group of or with uh, some, some Global North humanitarian institutions and researchers with many years of work in the global in the Global South. So I'll, I'll go on to present some of the key findings that came from the study. And, and the first key finding for us was around the issue of power, funding, and control. From the discussions we had for, with, with the interviewees, they did mention that the structure of humanitarian funding coming from the Global North mainly uh, leads to, you know, tends to favor the Global North uh, humanitarian research institutions or international organizations. And because of this structure of funding, it leads to an imbalance in power and control between the Global North and Global South humanitarian research institutions and researchers. First is the fact that because of this imbalance, Global South humanitarian institutions and researchers are not part of the initial discussions about humanitarian research funding. They, they are mainly brought on board very much later in the process as a way of to tick boxes in some cases, and not really to get their meaningful participation in setting the research agenda. And, and because of this, it makes it harder for them to actually to influence the research 
questions, the methods, and even the final outcome of the research. And this means that a lot of this research will not really reflect local priorities and needs of, of the study population because they're not informed from a local level. And, and because of this, again, the engagement tend to be very short term, project based and one sided. A, a lot of the Global South humanitarian research institutions mentioned that when they engage in partnership with Global North humanitarian research institutions or Global North international organizations, they tend to perform less valuable roles. Their roles are mainly reduced to things like, you know, being data collectors or managing field logistics for the global south, I mean, for the global north counterparts. And, and you know, conceptual thinking, the more valuable work in research are left for the global north researchers and humanitarian research institutions. And yet these are also the research that have the, the you know the roles that have that pay off mostly in research with longer term, you know. Uh, in the long term, they tend to have more visibility, but also more recognition, and, and even it opens opportunities to access future funding. But this is something because of the structure, it denies the global, global South humanitarian research institutions that opportunity. And when we spoke to people, people, global South humanitarian research institutions actually said, in many cases, it is so hard for them to get a core, a research, a research or funding that is dedicated to only conducting research. In many cases, they tend to embed funding for research in, 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 in programs or, human, or in humanitarian research interventions. So that, that really makes it hard for them to run sole research projects. So in many cases, they're running very small components of research and not really fully funded research like most global north humanitarian research institutions tend to do. And, and when we spoke to people, of course, they did mention that the examples of where they had equitable relationship were mainly linked to relationships between a global north researcher as an individual and a global south researcher or maybe a humanitarian research institutions. And these were not necessarily at an institutional level. And, and because of this, people mentioned that it is important to know that an individual global north researchers' good intention can, can be limited by institutional and structural conditions that are built on colonial legacies and white privilege. So again, the people stress the importance of ensuring that the changes should not only be about granting Global South humanitarian research institutions access to more funding, but really it has to be about changing the entire system, really a systemic change. The second key finding that we did come up with was around the unique value of Global South-led humanitarian research. From speaking to interviewees, they did mention that the Global, global South has a comparative advantage over the Global North in terms of in humanitarian research. This is because they are located in the research context, which gives them a better understanding of the context and local priorities that should inform the research. And because of this, when, it, when a research is Global South led, it will ensure that the research prior process, which includes the questions, the, the, uh, the, the, the methods, and even the final outcome that really reflect local priorities. And, and, and because Global led research are also likely to obtain more accurate responses from the study populations because people can easily identify with them. When people know who the faces are, when people can identify with the subject of study, they, they are more likely to give accurate response than when, when it is about something abstract that, they, that doesn't really matter to their day-to-day -to -day well being. So because of this, people also did mention that uh, when Global South humanitarian research institutions lead the research, they, they, will, they are more likely to bring back the research fi finding to the local level that can actually benefit the local population in terms of you know, the, having the possibility to engage with the research findings with the local leaders for their own advocacy or even to inform direct programs and policies that can benefit uh, the study population. These were some of the really key advantages. And because people can actually see some of these results, you know, that they can engage with the findings, this actually goes on to address 
usually the fatigue re related to several research. We know in several humanitarian contexts, people are conducting research almost on an everyday basis. And a lot of the study population feel fatigued by all this numerous research. But when they engage with it, they feel a sense of ownership and they feel like their voices have been heard and they are likely to give accurate results or accurate response. The last part of my presentation looks at the barriers that Global South humanitarian institutions face in, their, in, in the process of engaging in humanitarian research. Of course, the first part of it is the fact that Global North humanitarian institutions have unfair competition over their Global South counterparts. They, this is because they are familiar with the funding application processes. They also know the language, the jargons, and even they have the connections to the funding networks. For example, people mentioned that you know, Global North humanitarian research institutions and researchers have the opportunity or the funding to attend conferences, or they don't even require visas to go to some of these conferences where they can make connections about funding, about opportunities that are available for them. But in most cases, Global South humanitarian researchers finds it very hard to, for example, get visas or even to secure the funding to attend some of these conferences where they could actually make connections to get funding. Another key component of course or limitations in terms of uh, how the Global South engage in research has to do with the fact that they are, they are also, they also don't have the, the infrastructure, something that their Global South, Global North counterparts have. They don't have the research infrastructures that can support the application process. While whereas in the Global North, they have dedicated staff who supports the application process. And, and this really makes the application process more, much more easy and, and more competitive than, than, than those coming from the Global South. And, and for some Global North counterparts, they also do have core funding or flexible funding. This is something that they can easily use to set their own research agenda, to set their own terms, or even to negotiate with potential donors. For example, we do know that some funding requirements will say, you know, can you match up some of the funding? And once an institution have the core funding or the flexible funding, they could actually use some of those to match the funding that they're requesting. But this is something that a lot of the Global South humanitarian institutions do not have. On the contrary, of course, most Global South humanitarian institutions depend on short-term project-based funding, which further hinders the ability to develop their organization and even to provide a good compensation to their employees and especially between projects, especially when projects end, they don't know how to, to retain those staff. Some of them might be really good researchers, but because of funding difficulties, they can't keep them on. And uh, of course, this is compounded by the high funding, I mean, the, by the funding compliance requirement that most donors uh, put in place. For example, a lot of EU funding or even Global North funding can only go to institutions that are rejected in the Global North. These compliance requirements can only be met by international organizations or institutions that are based in the Global North. So in most cases, the Global South humanitarian research institutions have to depend on subgrants from the global south, I mean, from the global north humanitarian institutions or even from international organizations who they partner with. And of course, we did hear that this compliance requirement is partly driven by the perception that global south institutions lack the skills to manage large funding. So in, by way of ending, uh, we did hear that global south, again, are usually limited to specific geographic coverage. That, while this is a good thing because it deepens the knowledge of the context, it also limits the opportunities that are available to them compared to the global north counterparts who can move from one emergency to the other. And because of all of this put together, they find it so hard to, 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 keep, to maintain sustained funding that can, that can keep their research ongoing and even to maintain capable staff and dedicated research team. And we hear that a lot of them end up losing their staff at the end of a project, at the end of funding. And, and this, this really impacts badly on the future of their research agenda. I'll pass it on to Isabella.
Thank you so much, Teddy. And uh, now let's hear from Gang. Just a little uh, note, uh, he is in the middle of a storm, so he will not be turning on his video, I think, uh, due to uh, poor internet connection. So just by way of explanation. Okay, take it away, Gang. Gang. I'm, I'm so sorry, Gang, but you're breaking off actually. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you, depending upon where. For the moment, uh, my name is Gang Karume. As it's written there, I'm a technical advisor for a national organization based in uh, Eastern DRC, where uh, where I'm talking for. The Can you hear me, please? Yes, it's a little, a little bit unstable, but um, we can hear you for now. Let's see if this works. Otherwise, I might go to Jen and then come back to you. But let's try this first, gang. Can you hear me, please? Hi, gang. Yes, we can hear you. Isabella, can you hear me? OK, okay gang. gang. Uh, I'm so yes, sorry. I'll We're... say uh, good, uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, depending upon where you are. Uh, as I said, my name is Gang Karume, and I, can you hear me, Isabella? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, Gang, we can hear you. It's just there's a delay, I yeah. think. This is, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to share uh, my thinking uh, on uh, localization, on uh, the localization of humanitarian research uh, uh, on a local NGO perspective. And uh, I'll, I'll try to be as uh, fast as uh, uh, possible. And uh, what I'm, I want to flag out is that features are the same for both humanitarian and research in localization perspective. In, uh, in the sense that uh, as in humanitarian, we also talk about financing uh, uh, financing challenges. We also talk about power in partnership. We don't talk, we also talk about uh, 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 power dynamics. We talk about uh, about uh, uh, different considerations. Uh, but all in all, there's power differentials between the global north and the global south researchers are structural and systemic. And uh, there are so many examples for that. But at the end of the day, I would say that so as the system that is Is, is, is keeping on uh, the, these balances, these differences between the global north and the global south, it means that the solution should equally be structured and systematic. But otherwise, it, it, the researcher weighs from the south as the global south uh, researchers have made out their way from the global north. It means that it's just a perception to consider that. Next slide, please. please. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, can you still hear me? Are we still together? 
Yes, we are. Oh, We're here. Mm -hmm. uh, the European and the US El Dorado myth is really, really changed. Because today, people being in the South, they are really happy and proud that you have good institutions, you have good professors, you have all the facilities to make research in the global South. And it's no longer someone who's coming from a PhD uh, from New York, from the Euro is a must, is more qualified. The one who's bringing it from South Africa, or from Uganda, and from uh, from uh, uh, Cairo and whatever. And there are so many considerations, really, like I've been saying, I, I can see here on artificial intelligence taking precedence on human with, uh, intelligence. Uh, there are so many considerations in this uh, about the ge global economy that is changing gear of China coming actually called the BRICS. The global geopolitics are now being looked at in a different lenses. Before there were people who decide on behalf of the others. But today, this is changing. The current humanitarian system that has been uh, uh, decrypted in Istanbul, uh, it has failed out to deliver, and it needs a revisitation. And actually, research has not and will not is not only in humanitarian localization is also in the research localization is also in, in many sectors like in the private the private sectors all those sectors they have to be uh, looked at in the localization perspective next slide please please uh, thank you uh, now people can speak out their mind and uh, they now react uh, whatever they think if they know that what they think is right, what they say is right, what they write is right. They no longer care about these coercive measures, uh, the sanctions, exclusions, being deprived from visas, by, by bank account being blocked. People are not speaking out their minds. And here, there is nothing that is no longer out of the table. Everything is put on the table and people are freely speaking out their mind, including in the research area. In the research world also, people in the global north, people in the global south, they are talking about equality. They are talking about all being researchers. There is no longer a global north researcher, a global south researcher. This is, a, is, a, is going more and more out of the people's mind. And those, as I said before, decided on behalf of the others. They've realized that, yes, this is not to be revisited. It's no longer, okay, this diploma, this degree, this PhD coming from Congo is no longer valid. We consider the one coming to a PhD from Belgium. All that is changing. And localization, it's no longer something like in an abstract. It's something that is real. And people really need to consider that. They have to look at it in their daily thinking, in their daily doing. Next slide, please. Yeah, this publication is really, really good. I really love this publication because it has put all of us that are from the global north and the global south as a researcher. It's put us, look ourselves into a mirror, a big mirror so that Nobody could pretend that he doesn't see the other. The other. And the result is, is there is no other way around. We have to localize research. That mentality of colonialism that these ones are inferior, these ones are superior, this is about to disappear. We have to be clear about that. It has to disappear. And there is no longer, there is no room, there is no room to start uh, uh, putting us on uh, one side or uh, behind and the other uh, side forward. All the sides, they have to move to move along at the same pace because localization requires so. There are no longer those who are better than the others. There are no one those who are worse than the others. We are all looking in the same direction to localize the research. And that is 
That is it for the moment. Next slide, please. Uh, and I'm so happy because General uh, be coming just uh, after my presentation has come from USA, and USA is coming really at the right moment. At the right moment, and I think the others should pick up from USA and say this is the way to go. I'm talking about the uh, uh, the U European Union. I'm talking about uh, uh, FCDO. I'm talking about CEDA. All those major donors, they have to pick up from USA and consider that, yes, time for action is there, not tomorrow. It's now that we have to act. It, tomorrow may be too late. And fortunately also, the global South, the government, the, uh, the business people, they've noticed more and more that, why don't you promote our, our global South research? And that's what they are doing. The, the, the means can be not as many as they are in the global north, but at least that awareness is very thing is a very good thing we have to capitalize on. And as the way to to promote the global south research, which is growing up, I think the global north is also understanding that yes, we have to move along. Otherwise, we'll all be stupid losers. If you mutualize our efforts, we'll all be winners. If we don't mutualize our efforts, I swear, and I, I think there will be very few to contradict me, we'll all be, uh, I'm sorry for the, 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 the word, but we'll all be stupid losers. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. I'm um, thanking you very much for your attention. Should you have any question, maybe uh, Isabella will give us an opportunity to respond to your questions. And uh, later on, we can keep up uh, the talking. Over to you, uh, Isabella, and thank you again for your attention. Thank you so much, Gang, and thank you for uh, for sticking with us in spite of difficulties with uh, with your internet connection. I guess you've just provided us with a real life examples or uh, example of barriers that um, researchers in the global south may face. So I will now give the floor to Jen, uh, please. Jen, sorry, you're on mute. Thank you. Apologies. Uh, thanks, Isabella, and, and hello to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm just going to share a few comments from a donor perspective, and I'll, I'll try to keep these brief. So as, as Teddy highlighted, power, funding, and control are fundamental to the findings from this report, and any actions coming out of these findings and recommendations will need to address those fundamental issues. As part of the U.S. government, as a donor, and in fact, the largest humanitarian donor and the major research donor, the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance has a lot of all three. We wield them in award dollars and policies and procedures and in influence and in agenda setting. And we're mindful of that fact. USAID and BHA are trying to wield that power responsibly in a few ways, by prioritizing locally led humanitarian assistance and research, by channeling more funds directly to local partners, by making it easier for local organizations to partner with USAID, by advocating for more equitable partnerships between prime award holders and subawardees, and by strengthening local capacity where needed, among other, shift, among other shifts. So what does this really mean tangibly? Administrator Power has committed USAID to shifting 25% of funding to local actors by 2025, and having 50% of our funding led by local actors by the end of this decade. This is overall USAID funding, including humanitarian and otherwise, and including both implementation and research. We're also adapting our policies and programs to foster locally led work. This includes working to reduce administrative barriers to local partnerships, reviewing and streamlining our funding requirements and guidelines, and introducing more resources in languages other than English. USAID has updated its acquisition and assistance strategy and has revised its risk appetite statement to clarify the level and type of risk the agency is willing to accept in the pursuit of locally led partnerships. Last fall, USAID released a local capacity strengthening policy to establish agency-wide principles centered around the priorities, know-how, and existing capacities of local organizations. To foster partnerships, we developed workwithusaid.org, 
an easy to use website that provides clear and accessible information in multiple languages on navigating how to partner and work with USAID. And we're continuing to invest in the new partnerships initiative incubator, a mechanism which allows us to diversify and strengthen our partner base, expand USAID's capacity for partnership and help partner organizations work with USAID. The Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance is also finalizing a new policy for localizing humanitarian assistance, which outlines a phased trajectory for advancing localization through our policies, programs, and processes. Some of you may have seen the draft and shared feedback when it was released for comment and review last fall. We plan to release the revised policy later this spring. Within my own team at BHA, we are working on diversifying our partnerships, including actively reaching out to academic institutions and humanitarian research institutions with whom we haven't worked before. One of the other things that Teddy mentioned was the difficulty for Global South humanitarian research institutions to find funding for research outside of the immediate crisis aftermath. And our team's funding is not tied to specific responses, so it can be a great resource to support research by this type of organization. So localization is something that we're actively working on, but even with all of these efforts, there are still a lot of considerations that need to be addressed. And I'll mention just a few that stood out to me from the report. One is risk. On the one hand, the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance is accountable to the US Congress and people. And accordingly, we have high standards for compliance and a low risk tolerance. On the other hand, it may yet be the case that we can think about risk differently for an award of $10 million than a, an award of $100,000. And we're looking into how we can make compliance less burdensome for organizations that aren't as familiar with USG procedures and haven't had the same level of administrative investments. Overhead for Global South institutions is another issue that was raised. Um, at BHA, subawardees cannot currently apply for a negotiated indirect cost rate agreement, only prime awardees can, but they can charge de minimis indirect costs at no more than 10%. I'm wondering how we can ensure that adequate funds are going to subawardees to cover their administrative costs. And perhaps we should look at increasing the de minimis rate or maybe requiring that sub, um, subs negotiate a, an indirect cost rate agreement, even though that could potentially slow down award making. It's something else we're looking at. With regards to methods, USAID is not an academic institution. We aren't wedded to specific traditional methods and we welcome innovative and contextual approaches to research and learning. That said, we do value rigor and we wanna ensure meaningful results. I'm wondering if we could help support the uptake of more Global South developed methods by supporting their validation or as recommended in the report, supporting Global South humanitarian research institutions to compile a collection of Global South designed or inspired research methods and tools. With regards to generalizability, um, as a global organization, we operate simultaneously in many settings and we're always interested in research that we, we can apply broadly. I noted in the report the respondents' views that generalizability often comes at the expense of local applicability or benefit to the research population itself. So perhaps we need to reprioritize or reconceptualize our research goals internally to better balance these two potentially conflicting goals. And with regards to local dissemination, as a donor, we can ensure that local dissemination and engagement is built into projects as a requirement. There are some examples to draw from, like the donor, um, uh, uh, that, um, sorry, research and humanitarian health in crises, which requires a plan for local dissemination and uptake to be built into the initial application and some other models like that. This report is hugely rich and there's so much more that I can discuss, but I'll leave my remarks here and I look forward to the discussion and your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen. And thank you to all of you for sharing your perspective. Um, it was really great to hear from Teddy about the key findings from the Near and Tufts University uh, joint study on the localization 
of, of research. Uh, perhaps the key takeaway points that I'm hearing are that, well, firstly, Global South HRI's humanitarian research institutions, so, sorry, have a unique value in humanitarian research as they better understand the local context and priorities, which can lead to more accurate responses from the study population, uh, better chances of influencing local policymakers, and better dissemination of research findings at the local level. However, um, we also have heard that Global South researchers face many barriers in participating equitably in humanitarian research. They include, uh, for example, an imbalance in power and control and fair competition from Global North humanitarian research institutions, lack of sustained funding and high compliance requirement, um, requirements that lock them out of uh, funding opportunities. These barriers have led um, Gang, for example, to argue that um, power differentials between Global North and South researchers are embedded in global systems and structures, requiring, um, therefore, a structural change to fix. Um, and therefore, localization becomes a must um, and should be, and humanitarian research should be localized in aid packages to ensure equal funding, partnerships, uh, coordination capacity and uh, leadership among other issues. And lastly, we have heard from Jen that USAID is undertaking uh, internal reform, actions uh, and behavior change to ensure local actors lead and shape programs, uh, promote locally led development and respond to local communities. And this involves four lines of effort, I believe. So adapting from adapting policies and programs to foster locally led development, uh, shifting power to local actors, channeling a larger portion of funding um, directly to local partners and serving as a global advocate for uh, locally led development. So actually, perhaps let me start exactly from there. Before I go to the questions in the q and I'd like to ask each of you a question, and I will go to Jen first. Um, Jen, you have mentioned that USAID is taking some important steps towards uh, localizing research or localization. Could you please share some uh, practical examples? Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, yeah, so BHA is currently partnering with uh, CONCERN on the Beyond Borders Initiative. This is a two-year project with a heavy research focus designed to define operational solutions to overcome the barriers to a more localized humanitarian response. And this project works closely with um, academic research partners in five countries, including Malawi, Bangladesh, Syria, Somalia, and DRC. And it's working on contextualizing the local discussion and connecting with local NGO networks and government officials. Um, and BHA is also increasingly using remote project monitoring in non-permissive environments where our ability to operate safely and effectively is constrained. So for example, BHA in Mali has been working collaboratively with local researchers to build out a third party monitoring program over the last four years. And that experience proved particularly valuable during the COVID-19 pandemic when our reliance on local researchers increased exponentially and the model is transferred to other country contexts. Thank you very much for that, Jen. Um, I will move on to Teddy now. Um, Teddy, you have discussed some of the barriers that Global South researchers face in participating equitably in humanitarian research, but you've also noticed, uh, noted that um, it's not all that bleak. Uh, could you perhaps share some positive examples from the report? Thank you, Isabella. For sure, people did mention uh, a lot of interesting uh, things that are already emerging. Uh, key among them was the fact that since the end of, you know, since the, the grant began in 20, 2016, there's been some changes. One of those is there's, you know, there's been some shift in this course at the local level that now people are beginning to discuss, you know, about localizing not just humanitarian response, but as well as humanitarian research. So this is this is a good thing. And I remember one of the participants did mention that uh, 
one of the best outcome of all of the things that has happened around all the discourse around localization, the Grand Brigade, is the emergence, for example, of the NIA network that has really helped to center the discourse around localization in the global south. And, and that is something that really people do appreciate. And then because of the, all of this discourse, the discussion, the awareness, people did mention that this has increased opportunities, not in terms of actual funding, but in terms of uh, you know, strengthening organizational capacities of some of the global south humanitarian research institutions and researchers' capacity. Now they have the ability to do that. You know, their structures have been strengthened. But besides that, of course, like, like Jen has already mentioned, some donors are beginning to make, take steps or to change their practices or in terms of the, the requirements, you know, the requirements that they now put in place for accessing funding. There are those fundings that are only legible to Global South humanitarian research institutions or researchers. But of course, even though this is happening, they're not yet making adjustments to procedures to meet administrative, for example, administrative and financial realities of a lot of the Global South humanitarian research institutions. Uh, also, I think like Jen already mentioned, they're really paying attention to context as, as a factor. It's you know a lot of appreciation that context does matter, and a lot lot more consultations is happening now than that it was happening before. But also there are changes to you know we have had for example of how some particular global north researchers when they come on the ground they're very attentive to how they work with global south researchers. They impart knowledge, they impart skills, they take it as a process of co-production of co-creation of research and not necessarily as something about them, not necessarily as extractive as, as it used to be. So yes, we see we, we see some changes happening or people did say there were some changes happening from the study. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teddy. Um, now we'll go to Gang, hoping that the connection will stay stable. Um, Gang, as a local actor, how are you making yourself heard? Could you please share some examples of activities you are undertaking towards uh, localization? Thank you very much, Isabella, for the question. Uh, I think Teddy started in saying uh, lacking knowledge of local con uh, context is really, really prejudiced to a good quality research. And I think uh, global South researchers are getting more and more aware of that perspective. And this is what actually they are bringing on the table to say, look, you'd you better have a research, but a research that is missing out the global, the ground uh, the reality, the community's involvement, the local authorities' involvement it has something that with something precious that is missing. And this is one thing that we're not putting on the table to say, yes, the context is, is very important. And the other thing is the quality of our, uh, our, our degrees is no longer a, 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 a specific a, a property, let's say like that, let's put it that way. It's no longer a, a global north property. It is now a universal property that is, in, as, as I said, the gray zone, that is the Middle East. We have good researchers there. We have good researchers in the North. We have good, good researchers in the, in the South. And that mentality is moving out of the head of every, all, all the tendencies, well, all the, 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 the tendencies. Global North, Global South, and that uh, uh, gray zone that is the Middle East. All of us have understood that when going on together, we are winners. When going at, uh, separately, we are losers. And we are making more and more ourselves uh, 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 work in, in platforms. Like in DRC, for example, there is now a national humanitarian platform that engages with all actors. And <laughs> excuse me, that is well recognized by all national, international, private sector actors, and they deal with them. This is the effort also we are doing as global South researchers to pull together as a platform to say, this is what you have to value. This is what you have to value. 
and we are valuing it, and we are getting more and more heard. Like Mary Fitzpatrick is coming from a reputed university from, from the United States. She came and joined us in a, I'm a researcher from, from Congo. And she respects me because of what she knows I know. And we've been able to make a research together. I've been doing the same with Columbia University, which is a very highly reputed university. It means that time moving on, people are understanding, institutions are now understanding that, yes, the global South also has something to bring on the table. I would stop there for the moment. Thank you. Thank you, gang. Thank you so much. Um, okay. So I could personally keep asking questions, but I'm sure that you too have questions. So let's now <coughs> open, and open it up to the audience. I see that we've got a few questions in the Q&A. So perhaps I will start from those. Um, maybe I'll go to, um, maybe I will go to Teddy. Teddy, um, are there any specific research agenda that came up from um, the Global South that is different from the agendas of the Global North? Well, I think one, one of the things that uh, people did mention was the fact that a lot of times donors who the Global North donors and international organizations or even humanitarian research based in the Global North tend to front research agendas that, that favor their own interests, their own agendas, that, that in the Global South, people see it as disconnected and not really responding to, to, to some of their, their needs. So what people would like to see more are really particular research that, that things, for example, investigates, uh, you know, the impact of humanitarian emergencies on on the day to day well being of local people. I think you know facts around livelihoods because people did mention, for example, that uh, one of the things that happen in humanitarian emergencies that actually do affect the capacities of researchers in the global south is the emergency in itself that makes them more vulnerable and poorer. So those are some of the things that I guess people are saying. Can we understand more? how emergencies actually also do impact not just the world being the day-to-day -day lives of people in the global south, but also how it does impact, you know, the capacity for research in this in some of this context. So that, you know, when 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 we're talking about localizing research in some of these contexts or engaging researchers from this context, we actually do understand the challenges that are there and how to embed them or in address them in, in, in those applications. And that would make sure that any applications are more, are more grounded and, and speak to the specifics of the issues that are happening on the ground than, than making assumptions, for example, about risk, for example, about, uh, and on all of the other things that, that people in, because like we said, contexts are very different. You can't just assume that Global South is Global South. Uganda is different from Congo, but even within Uganda, specific contexts in the country are still very unique, like the north of the country is different from the south of the country. So people are really, you know, pushing for more localization just beyond saying global south, global north, but localization that really speaks to, to the actual reality on the ground or research that really looks at at those contexts that are that addresses specific identities on the ground, which could be along gender, race, and all of these things, uh, you know, that that is beyond the global south, global north binary. Uh, that that's really maybe somebody else would like to add. Jen, would you like to add maybe to this? Or oh, is somebody... Thank you for that, Teddy. Yeah, I think absolutely some of the one of the findings that came up from the from the study was that um, the the research agenda for local organization, local and national organizations was often very much tied to the context um, because uh, they wanted their research agenda to be very aligned to the needs of the of the population. So perhaps that's yeah in line with what you were talking about. I will move on to another question now. Uh, this is a question I see that um, Gang has already started answering, but perhaps we could look at this uh, some more. So um, Gang, can you share 
uh, what would be a good international research partner for your work and what then makes a good partner? And this question is from Anita. Uh, as I already replied in the chat, I said, uh, for me, it's a partner who first respects me, uh, who does not put forward money in the research business before any other consideration. That's the first international partner I can think about. And then on top of that, it's the one who considers me as a researcher. That's it, not from the global north or the global south, whatever, it's a researcher, period. And finally, the one with whom talks science and only science, we're not going out of other considerations uh, that will, will, will put that in, uh, in confusions. The one who will accept that we co-produce, the one who will accept that it's a, it's a team effort, but it doesn't have any specific person to value himself more than the other. And those in the global north, they are many. They do exist. And there are, are so many who have understood it and are now advocated for it. That's the part I'm talking about. That would be my, my, my dream person. And they do, they are there. I have so many examples about that as an organization and as an individual researcher. Thank you. Thank you for that, Gang. Um, I will move to a question for Jen. Um, so how Victor asks, how can local NGO in Venezuela, why their BHA research in Venezuela? Our organization is involved in a humanitarian project right now, but not directly. How can we make it larger as there are many other needs to attend to and we believe we know better the national context? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the great things about BHA having folks in the field is that you can approach them with those ideas, with those needs. So my first recommendation would be to reach out to the team that is on the ground there in the mission um, to approach them with your thoughts on the research that you see as being important and needing to be done. Um, and then further, I think, you know, there's the technical and folks in DC that are also open to, to hearing from partners that see needs. Um, you know, we, we can't be everywhere all at once and, and are definitely open to hearing those ideas and those thoughts. So please feel free to share them with us. I think it's important to get um, different perspectives, um, you know, on what we're missing and what else needs to be covered. Thank you, Jen. Um, I want to ask a question that I see uh, Gang is re responding to in writing, but Teddy, perhaps this is a good question for you. How can we move past the perception that researchers, sorry, this is from Cordelia. How can we move past from the perception that researchers from the Global South can only do research of local significance and for local application, as you were saying, while for world-class generalizable research that can be uh, globally significant, one needs researchers from the North. I hear this assumption a lot, but I think it needs to be interrogated. Thanks, Isabella. I, I think for me, this is partly an issue that has to do with a few things in humanitarian research. One of those is language, tied to language, of course, access to grant, capacity, but also uptake and visibility. All of these factors do determine how, to what extent, Global North, or oh, I mean Global South humanitarian researchers can actually produce uh, research of significant value that can be recognized as world-class. And, and, and that is really, so I think one, one of the things that emerged from the discussions was the fact that right now, English, you know, is, is sort of gatekeeping, you know, and uh, is access to a lot of things, not just funding, but also to what uh, journals, you know, like journals you can access, especially the ones that are of high standard, high ranking. And people did say in the end that we should actually consider the impact on language on, um, on equitable participation of, of researchers from the global south, especially, and, and really shift the discussion away from, uh, or shift away from this, you know, a, a large focus or a navy focus on English as the dominant language or the use of some jargons, because all of those are really some of the issues that uh, make people feel 
you know, humanitarian researchers from the global south cannot produce work of high value, work of high standard. But of course, the other thing, like I said, has to do with visibility as well. We see that there's a lot of research that is happening in the global south. But the only challenge is that a lot of those are not coming to the mainstream journals, to the, to the publications that are well known. So a lot of people do not get to understand or know that you know so so and so who are based in the global south are doing this significant amount of work and research so a key part of it is to begin to actually make some of these uh general requirements uh more friendly more accessible for research researchers in the global south so they can publish their work so they can gain the phys the visibility that comes with it, but also this comes with how the entire research process is set. Because if you're leaving them from the beginning and then you bring them only to collect data, then they're not going to have the authorship of some of these reports. That is usually where the problem lies because of this, it, it's systemic. It's it's not just about that they don't have capacity, but I think it's a, a, an idea that has been inbuilt from generations that tend to see and position those, you know, the races, elitist, uh, you know, prejudices around what the global South is. It's not necessarily true. A lot of researchers actually from the global South are trained from some of these world-class universities in the West. And, and of course, that, that somebody would argue that then they, they, they cease to be representing or they cease to be global South, but still that could make them do significant significant you know work and uh, produce really great research but but the, the challenge is usually with the publications but also from their young age a lot of them have not grown up in the systems that are you know that are very entrenched in in the use of english that promote you know publication in certain or writing in a certain way and all of this really makes it harder so i think it has to do with changing how we view or value what is considered significant that has to do with maybe English as the dominant language and or use a certain jargons, but also how you know they can be encouraged or helped to, to publish in, in some of these key journals, key publications that will make their work more visible and recognized. Thank you so much, Teddy. I will go to a question from uh, an anom anonymous attendee. It's for Jen. Um, the humanitarian system by and large fails to understand or address how language barriers and linguistic power dynamics impact the process, quality, and representativeness of research. What can humanitarians, humanitarian donors do to ensure the international level organization acknowledge and act on language barriers that impact who gets to undertake research? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's an issue that came up in the report as well, this, this question of, you know, language as a barrier. Um, I mean, I think we can, as we're trying to do, we're trying to make sure that language isn't a barrier to partnering with us as a first step. We're trying to publish, um, you know, more guides and more tools in other languages than English as a first step, um, and I think we can also look to how we can support more organizations that aren't functioning in English as a first language. Um, this is this is an ongoing challenge because obviously there are also like compliance issues that that come up with uh, language as a question. Um, but it's you know I think something that we're aware of, something that we're thinking about, um, and certainly we can help with just broadening our network of partners. Um, just last week. Uh, I, there was a roundtable discussion on this same topic that included uh, live real-time translation so that researchers from different countries could participate in the same conversation. And I think that kind of event is a really valuable way to bring people um, to the same table, sharing ideas, even when they don't share the first primary language. So exploring more ideas along those lines um, is also another first step. Thanks. Thank you for that, Jen. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question for Gang. Rania is asking for you to clarify your, the point you made about the money dimension, 
specifically in regards to joint research initiatives. Um, her specific in interest is that there are uh, systemic research resource, sorry, gaps in Global South humanitarian research institutions, and so how to sort of reconcile those uh, challenges. I think gang, Gang's connection is not good. So I'm sorry that, I, that we will ask that question again if he manages to come back on. In the meantime, I will go to a question for Teddy. Uh, Ruth asks about South to South humanitarian research partnerships and how funders can be effective to make those partnerships possible. Thank you, Ruth, for the question. I think what, what we had was that when it's a South, South partnership, there's a likelihood to have more eco partnership because they know each other, they're more flexible, they work alongside each other. And it's 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 something that a lot of the, the, the people we consulted felt was more desirable. So in terms of how funders can make that work better, people did recommend uh, really trying to establish, for example, because again, not all the Global South humanitarian research institutions are at the same level, that, 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 that has to be clear. Some of them are much larger with better funding while the smaller ones, the smaller ones tend to have less or don't, don't have a lot of funding. So I think it's, it's important to do, to have a, a good understanding of where they are and not to really treat all Global South institutions as a one size fits all, that a lot of these institutions have got their own dynamics and differences that, you know, any, for example, funding uh, requirements should be able to respond to some of these dynamics and differences. But one of the things, of course, people did mention is that you could also work through, for example, an entity that is based in the global south. People were, for example, saying you could work through a group like NIA to sort of check up some of the administrative and, and financial requ or compliance requirements that donors tend to use as an excuse not to fund uh, institutions in the global south to, to bear that burden on behalf of the smaller humanitarian research institutions. And then they can use that to channel the funding to the local level. But also I guess some of the ideas were around, you know, working through consortium or partnerships of local of, of local, local humanitarian research institutions, in that way, the bigger ones can absorb some of the, 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 the risk that would be, you know, would come by directing funding directly to the smaller ones. So those are some of the ideas that people actually came up with in terms of what can be done to, uh, to make it to, for, by donors to make funding more accessible to, to Global South uh, humanitarian research institutions. Thank you so much, Teddy. Um, I have a question for Jen. Uh, the question is from me here. Uh, he asks, to what extent is it possible to put the last first, that is placing research resources under the custody of the Global South Humanitarian Research Institution? Well, I think that's part of our goal. And that's you know part of our interest in supporting this particular research. I think we see at USAID the importance of supporting more directly local institutions, whether that's directly implementing humanitarian action or, or humanitarian research, and we're investigating how we can better do that. Um, that fits in with our larger localization goal at USAID, and you know, my team in particular funds a variety of research, and we are actively trying to figure out how we can um, work within the current system and what changes need to be made so that we can fund more directly. Um, that's definitely that's definitely exactly what we're working on, and I appreciate that priority. Thank you very much, Jen. Um, Teddy, I will go back to you. So you discussed actually a little bit about this, about INGOs, uh, poaching local NGOs. And so uh, Samula is asking, the brain drain is perpetual because NGOs offer greater job stability and amenities. So what can local NGOs do to retain talent? I think some of the things people did mention had to do with, of course, more sustained funding. 
And of course, sustained funding means you're building the research infrastructure, you have access to better longer term funding, but also it's not just about funding because a key part of the poaching and losing of staff has to do with poor pay uh, offered by Global South humanitarian research institutions. And so that means they also need to offer more or more or better competitive uh, remuneration for their staff and packages that, that are almost at par, for example, with their global north counterparts. But of course, I know a lot of times people tend to think when you're, you're a local researcher or you're a local staff, it's like the risk you face seems to be less or you need less to live on. So I guess some of those are some of the discussions that really need to be held about you know, what is commensurate in different contexts, what is considered good pay for what levels and for what position so that people feel that they can live comfortably. So I guess a part of it is really offering good pay, but also more stability, because when it's longer term, people will feel like, you know, I can recover even if it's not very good pay, but, you know, after five years, you know, that will give me good ground. So really sustained funding, uh, better compensation and packages, uh, but also really people feeling that they have the voice and recognition. Because uh, what we also had was the fact that some of the Global South humanitarian research institutions in themselves stifle the growth of especially junior researchers. Of course, we, the same way we're discussing about the Global North, Global South, you know, dynamics also exist within some of these global south humanitarian research institutions really acknowledging that these dynamics also exist within the global south institutions addressing them and making the working environment more you know conducive where people feel listened to where people feel they can participate they can bring up their ideas and they're not shut down you know because they don't respond to for example to what the global north donors want but really listening I think for me, th those are some of the things I would I would say. Thank you, Teddy. Thank you so much for raising some very important points. Um, I will move back to Jen. Jen, um, this is a question for you. How do we also use for evidence and as research products all the work put in research work uh, for program development. It is, it may not be called research, but it is surely evidence uh, and, a, and of a lot of value. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I spent years working in uh, operational NGOs and you're right, you, you produce quite a lot of uh, data and evidence that is useful. I think there are a few efforts um, at making this more shareable and more accessible. And a couple that come to mind are um, the Humanitarian Practice Network that's hosted out of um, ODI's Humanitarian Policy Group, and also the ALNAP um, Clearinghouse of Evaluations. I think those are a couple of places where that more um, practice level data is, is shared amongst organizations and can be valued, um, even if it's not being published in a journal the way that some other research is. I certainly think that it has value. And um, I think, you know, I know we were just talking with um, the Humanitarian Practice Network and they're really looking at how can we shift that to be a more local hub um, and bring in a more, uh, you know, diverse array of partners to participate in that. So um, yeah, I'd say looking at some of those kinds of platforms. Um, I know there are also some Global South institutions that are really working on building up the networks within, within between Global South institutions. And I think there are some burgeoning um, platforms in those spaces as well that could serve the same purpose and potentially be very useful. Um, but absolutely agree that that's also an important source of information. Thank you, Jen. Thank you very much. Um, there definitely is a lot of evidence that is uh, created in, in different ways. So on that note, actually, uh, Teddy, I have a question for you uh, about the concept of research, I guess. Uh, Mihir is asking, um, Teddy, do you not think that the way research as a concept and process and product is defined uh, now is too uh, Global North humanitarian research institution centric? Uh, so as an example, he put the example of the notion of field. Hello. Uh, sorry, I was trying to 
I need to look up that particular question. Yes, uh, I think this, this also emerged in our own research that the way research is currently framed and approached is, is very much based on the global north uh, concept or their own understanding or perspective. And that makes it, you know, most times when you talk about research, there are some things you have to take which includes the methods, ethics, and all of these things that are really Global North centered or Global North focused. So people really did say, yes, the way research it is typically defined, it's uh, as a systematic generalization of generalizable knowledge about a topic or to inform theories. So the people we talked to actually tend to we say that in the global south, they tend to focus more on the elements of the process rather than the aim of research. And, and of course, this included systematic data collection activities that were not necessarily generalizable, such as needs assessments or program evaluation. So a lot of the, the way that people now talk about research is, is seen as very Western. So it has to be, you know, for example, people even talked about, around about things like storytelling. Those could also be forms of research, and and that is very much uh, identifiable in the global south in contexts where knowledge is more orally passed than based on written, you know, um, documentation. Or it could be through music, it could be through other forms of, you know, uh, ways of doing research or gaining, you know, rich information about a particular thing. So yes, the way it is, it is now, it's very much global not oriented than, than 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 it is for the global south thank you teddy i have a question for jen um so you have mentioned from from rania uh, you have mentioned that uh, bha is probably the largest donor in the humanitarian system there are many initiatives that aim to accelerate people's centered community-led approaches that are informed and shaped by timely research Yet, um, often those research resources are quite fragmented and ad hoc. Are there efforts to consolidate a research agenda to, inf uh, to inform actions by clusters, which may also facilitate more sustainable long-term investment in local platforms? Sure, thanks. Um, so one of the things I mentioned previously was that BHA is currently working on finalizing a policy on the localization of, humanit uh, of uh, humanitarian action. And that policy, I mean, part of the goal of that is to create a, um, you know, an, an overarching approach and strategy within BHA to our localization efforts, um, which will include specific implementation steps. So I think that kind of effort will help to focus and consolidate, as you mentioned, some of the different initiatives that are that are currently ongoing and bringing them together into an overarching approach. Um, I think just in general within USAID as a whole, as uh, you know, administrator power is putting a, a significant emphasis on localization, there is a, an intention and, a, and an effort to do that, to, to bring together these themes. Um, localization is a, is a key priority in um, it's definitely something we're trying to take a more strategic approach to. Within my own team, we're, we're trying to take a step back and look at the different research we're funding and seeing how that fits into, um, how it complements each other and fits into an overall agenda. So um, definitely appreciate your comment, um, you know, recognizing that there are a lot of different pockets of really good work happening and recognizing the importance of tying those together into an umbrella to, to push things forward further. And uh, it's, I would say, in progress. Thank you. Thank you for that. Teddy, I have another question for you. Um, you are in very high demand in the Q&A. So I uh, have one from Sophie. Uh, she says, as a researcher in clinical medicine with special interest in severe acute malnutrition, I highly depend on my partners in the Global South. I value my work, but still I am situated in the Global North most of the time. What are your thoughts on the use of qualitative tools like need, needs assessments and focus groups for identifying and prioritizing the local needs in the development of research protocols? Thank you, Sophia. Uh, I think, yes, yeah, this is this is really important. I think our research, uh, you know, approaches like focus group, key format interviews, uh, they are all important 
for, for determining how research really plays out. But I think what, what people did say that all of this needs to be informed by the context. It needs to be, be you know, being, you know, based in the global north means you really need to engage your own, uh, you know, your, your, your global north counterparts, I mean, global south counterparts, that they're able to deeply inform the process before you actually conduct it. I think that there are good steps to generate information on important things, but the process is what counts. At what point do they get involved? Are they getting involved at the tail end to collect data that they send to you or they're part of the actual process from the design? to how it is then administered in the field to the analysis, because even how you analyze and interpret some of the things you're seeing are, are, are informed by the context, are informed by the social conditions of those communities. Like the position of women might determine, you know, whether or not the children get malnourished. So all of these concepts, like, because it determines what resources they can have available to them or what, how they can be more resilient or how they can overcome a disaster. So all of this really for me is, is important, yes. And I think needs assessment and all of the things that you've mentioned really provide useful insights of how you can uh, focus group discussions or how you can dig information about what is happening, but it's in the structuring, it's in the understanding of the context that will enable you understand what is actually driving the context of acute malnutrition, what is driving the context of, you know, the impoverishment or all the food crisis that we see in those contexts. And because it's not just about malnutrition, malnutrition must be embedded in, within some things or political economy of the, or, or, of the community. And, and you can only do that when you have a good understanding of the context. So yeah, that, that would be really what I say uh, in terms of, yeah, sorry, I forgot to put my camera on. Yeah. Thank you, Teddy. No problem at all. Jen, I have another question for you. Um, it's from Mary. She asks about, um, she says that the competitive process for RF, RFAs puts Global South humanitarian research institutions at a disadvantage and makes them compete against each other. How can the process be adjusted to allow more equitable access to research opportunities? Yeah, um, I mean, this too is something that I talked about a little bit earlier. You know, we're looking at maybe we can simplify the process for uh, a smaller award as opposed to a giant award and maybe make it a little bit easier to partner with USAID on, on certain projects. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to reduce those barriers when we can. So for instance, the Work With Us website is really trying to make um, it very much clearer what the requirements for partnership are and how to share your ideas with USAID. Um, so taking those kind of steps to try to lower those entry barriers. Um, I think we're also trying to just get to know more institutions in, um, in, in the global south and the work that they're doing so that there are some opportunities where we might be able to develop a project together um, that you know is specific to a setting and doesn't go through the same um, large scale RFA process. Um, and I uh, have lost my train of thought, but <laughs> it's it's definitely something that we're thinking about um, trying to reduce those those barriers and those hurdles where we can. We also have, you know, for we have different kinds of mechanisms. and sometimes for a, a more straightforward project that is with a newer partner, we can kind of um, take a different approach than what you know, take a different kind of award. It might make it a little bit easier to get it into action a little bit faster. Um, so it's definitely something we're working on. I'd say that's something USAID as a whole is very aware of and um, and working on, and, and we're trying to reduce those barriers. I know that's not a, a very specific answer um, because I think there's a lot of little pieces that go into how we reduce those barriers, but it is something that we're working on. Thank you, Jen. Um, so on the note of competition, I guess, Teddy, I ask, I will ask you a question about um, what from Pamela. Uh, she says, thanks for the really insightful discussion. Were there any themes that emerged around unequal pay between local and international researchers and how this has been addressed? Thanks, Pamela. I, yeah, so we had some discussions around 
not just paper fed, but actual treatment of local researchers when they work alongside the global north counterparts. Of course, it starts from the actual pay, you know, the state of living, and all of this context. But also, it came out to things like the risk that that uh, global south humanitarian research institutions, uh, I mean, or researchers are. Uh, face when they're working in their own context. And yet a lot of times um, what we've seen is that, you know, some of the research fundings don't actually prioritize, for example, life insurance or other forms of insurance or for local researchers. It's as though people think because you're local, you, you're kind of used to the risk in those contexts. So one of those was around, you know, because that in itself, you know, makes, you know, the working condition better, knowing that you have something that you can fall back on when, when you're faced with some risk. The other thing, of course, had to do with uh, just facilitation in the course of you know, doing research, which has to do with transportation, lodging, all of these factors were, were issues that emerge. For example, in, in most cases, because they matter for the work that, that local researchers do. In, in most cases, we had that, you know, there are different treatment for for, for global north researchers when and, and global south researchers you might you know find a global south researcher sleeping in a you know a cheaper accommodation because that is what is provided for while the the, the global north researcher has to take the upper hand i end you know hotels or lodges in, in that context so that creates you know a difference it's subtle but it is an issue even transportation in some contexts, the global north researcher will fly while the global south researcher will have to, you know, use either public transportation or even they the provided transportation that actually makes them that ha don't have proper tires and all of these things because you're not willing to put the money into it. But when it's the global north researchers on the ground, you're hiring the most best expensive car because, you know, they are their own travel comfort is prioritized compared to that of the Global South researcher. And, and the other issue I think that also might was had to do with the gender of, of uh, when it comes to really engaging in research, that there's some risk, for example, are more are much more um, you know, likely to be, uh, women are more likely to face some risk more than their male counterparts. Like when you're traveling and the car breaks down or you have to sleep in the car or there's no proper sleeping in some context, a woman cannot socially, they're not allowed to live in, in, in such a setting or it could raise suspicion. So a lot of these things for me, I think, uh, uh, really does does matter for 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 the whole concept around compensation or payments because all of this eventually builds up to what somebody would con consider a good working condition or not so it is not just an study but the main of course the main issue is to actually pay the takeaway what does somebody take back with them at the end of the day that 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 is really an issue because in most cases people say like the global north, even though they're living in that context, they'll be pay, for example, in US dollars, while the researcher will be say, no, we can only pay you in your local currency. And sometimes what I've asked personally, because I'm based in the global south, are you paying for my skill or you're paying for, you know, because of the country where I'm based? So the issue is, do we pay people because of their capacity, the expertise they have, or because of the countries where they're living in? And because of that, people actually did say most times, uh, some global south researchers will then take up what they call international jobs, become experts. That way they can also hand the kind of salaries their counterparts who come to work in their countries uh, get. And, and that really takes away the, 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 you know, the capacities that the country need. Because if you're from that country, that means you have a good sense of how things happen, the context. But then if you are forced to leave because of poor pay, poor remuneration and working condition, that really deprives you know, the entire research process of the key knowledge and skill that they would have put or contributed in the process of research. So it is really a disservice to, to local capacity building or even local, lo, local building local research capacity in, in, in the countries where, where research is happening. 
Thank you so much, Teddy, for that. And thank you to all the panelists, really, for answering the questions and sharing their experiences in spite of uh, you know, poor internet connectivity and, and um, other technical problems. Unfortunately, we have to stop the Q&A here to keep to time. Once again, please remember that if we haven't answered your question, you can email me and I will respond or pass the question on to the most appropriate speaker. Also, if you have more questions, please don't miss, miss our upcoming Twitter space on Tuesday the 14th at 10 a.m. EST. And please do check your time zones because this is the time of the year where some countries change the time. Uh, we will put the link for you to set a reminder on Twitter in the chat right now, I think. Um, so thank you so much for um, participating. Goodbye. Thank you.